Those lights are bright. Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And there was some debate this morning as to whether I should address the lump on my face. <laughs> so if you have good eyesight, my jaw's a little swollen up. It was worse uh, last night. And the answer is no, it is not because Heather punched me in the face. All right, she told me to say that I fell. So <laughs> that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Uh, so it's going to be one of those mornings. This should get pretty interesting, uh, as my tablet just totally disagrees with me here. No notes. That would be really, really bad, uh, especially today. So um, here's what really happened. About halfway through my sermon, I noticed I'm getting really hungry sometimes, so I packed a little extra food in there. It'll disappear. <laughs> now, it's called emergency oral surgery, so that's what happened to me. Um, so this could be interesting. Yeah, this, this could be an interesting uh, sermon today. So I'll start with a story, <laughs> even though the ice is clearly broken. Story about... <laughs> <laughs> so is my jaw. Sorry about two friends. Don't feel sorry for me. I deserve worse. <laughs> two friends. They're good friends. They know each other really, really well. And one's really sad. And it doesn't take a best friend to notice that this guy's sad. His eyes are welling up. He's about to cry. And so the friend says, friend, what's got you so down? Why are you going to cry? What, what's going on? He's like, oh, I, I, you wouldn't understand. Forget it. No, no, no. No, I want to help. Let me, let me alleviate this burden. You know, Put it on me. All right, here's the thing. Three weeks ago, my uncle died and left me $50,000. So he's like, well, I could see that's a mixed blessing, why you're upset. He's like, wait, wait. But two weeks ago, my cousin, who I never met, died. And he left me $100,000. Well, <laughs> that's a blessing. But, but last week, my aunt passed away. And she left me $250,000. So the friend's like, well, I think I got this. I know why you're sad. So here's what you're trying to do. It's a lot of loss in three weeks. You experienced a lot of loss. I think that's it. And, and the lesson here is that money can't buy happiness, right? No. I said, why are you sad? Well, this week... Nobody died. And nobody left me any money. <laughs> yes, we can often come to a point where <laughs> we expect, I got that right? Did I get that right? <laughs> we expect certain blessings, taking the ones we already have for granted. We're going to kind of look at that today. Last week, can you see, can you hear, do you recognize Jesus' voice, right? It's a key to cutting through all the noise and the confusion out there, recognizing Jesus' voice. Well, now that we recognize his voice, here's the question. Will we obey it? You're like, oh, I thought this was going to be an easy week. No. <laughs> so today, we're going to talk about taking things for granted, especially God's grace. So, no chart today uh, to explain this to you. Uh, if you're not new here, I'll keep it short. Sometimes we have charts because we're doing the Bible in chronological-ish order. It's not in chronological order. You have four Gospels, for example. That's where we are. And sometimes they give different perspectives. And so, some will have whole sections that are not in the others. We're kind of running into-ish that. So, we're back in Luke, Luke 14 through 16, if you're following along. Um, Larger sections, just so you know, it's a good reminder, is going to show us how certain things connect. Even maybe if you've never been in church before, you probably heard one of these parables. And the problem is, is people kind of interrupt Jesus. I've talked about this in the past. You know, they come in late to a sermon or they leave early or they do both and they don't get the point. When in larger sections like this, sometimes it's just like all Jesus talking. You got to think about that, right? So it's the Sermon on the Mount. 5 through 7, Matthew. It's just Jesus talking. There's no interruption there, right? So we say, oh, but let's just study Matthew 5, right? <laughs> but what do you do if you're preaching a sermon? Jesus does this. He clarifies himself. He'll start with one thing, speak in a lot of hyperbole, and then he'll round it out. And he'll go, but, you know, or clarify the statement here. And so when we leave the sermon, we miss that. 
And so we're going to see a theme here. And it gets very interesting when you stretch out these larger sections. Like Jesus is going somewhere with it. And you'll see a progression in these parables, which most people don't necessarily see. Uh, so again, no chart. Let's just hop right in. Luke 14. We're going to start at verse 25 because we covered some of the other stuff last week. Uh, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must by comparison hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. So we'll get to the point later. So I'm going to kind of go through this for you so you don't have to be staring at the screen all the time. He continues, but don't begin until you count the cost. For would someone begin construction on a building without first calculating the cost? So what is his point? Well, you could run out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. Look at that guy who started the building and couldn't even afford to finish it. He continues, what king would go to war against another king with his 10,000 men against the other king's 20,000 men as it approaches the city? Won't he send a delegation to make peace? All right. So he continues, you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how will you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So there are those ears to hear again. So this is about calculated commitment. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, but hang on to that. Remember what Jesus does before he says, hey, come on, let's just get baptized. There was a lot there, wasn't there? Calculated commitment. You won't stay committed unless you know what you signed up for, right? You're going to fall away. And that's the point. It's about being committed and obedient. If you're wondering, salt in the covenants is also a sign of permanence. You are to be permanently obedient. Luke 15.1, he continues, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for that one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he'll joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. And he continues with another parable. A woman has 10 coins. If she loses one of them, she's going to sweep the whole house, look under everything, scour it, just to go after that one lost kind. And when she's found it, she'll have her friends over and rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. He continues, Luke 15, 11, to illustrate the point. Further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. He began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. The man sent him out in his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods, or carob pods, he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. So, you know, if we continue, you've probably heard the story. When he came to his senses, he said, I know what I'll do. The servants want for nothing. They're not starving at my father's house. I'll go back and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm not worthy to be your son, but take me back as your slave. So, then you get this scene where he decides to go back and the father's ready, like welcome, running towards him with the open arms, right, to embrace the son that was lost. And he goes through about almost the spiel, right, and apologizes. And he says to his servants, look, no, no, get my son a ring, a robe, sandals, like dress him up. He was lost, but now he's found. Then you get another picture of the brother coming in from the fields, working. So they kill the fattened calf. They're having this festival. He's like, what's going on? What's all the noise? 
Servant tells him, that's your brother. He was lost, but now he's been found. What? He gets angry. He won't go into the party. Father comes out, what's up? Come on in. He was lost, and now he's been found. No, you haven't done anything. I've been by your side this whole time, Father, but you've never even sacrificed any animal for me or done anything like this. Again, he's lost, but now he's been found. He doesn't want anything to do. It even accuses him. He squandered all his money on prostitutes, he says. He doesn't want to go in, but the father's point. He's dead, but now he's come back to life. So here's the thing. <clears throat> we continue. So he's lost, but now he's been found. Luke 16.1, Jesus told this story to his disciples. No break here, just a chapter, which is awkward sometimes when you're reading the Bible. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you're going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know what I'll do to ensure that I have plenty of friends who will get me home when I'm fired. So he invites in different people. One who owed money to his employer. <clears throat> the first one he asked, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill, change it to $400. All right? And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. The manager said, change it, 800 bushels. Jesus is speaking this. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal who had been so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than the children of the light. So here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. If you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, won't you be dishonest or, on, or you won't be honest with greater responsibilities? And... If you're untrustworthy about worthy wealth, who will trust you with? True riches in heaven. And if you're not faithful with another person's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? So we've seen some of these teachings before. So it'll continue. It doesn't stop. So if you've missed the point and you think that Jesus is talking about getting money or being shrewd, he says this, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Are you reading along? That's what it says, right? Yes. <laughs> the Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, heard all this and scoffed at him. They said to them, You like to appear to be righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable on the sight of God. There's a doubling, tripling down. So some of these are from the Sermon on the Mount. There's a comment that the law will not pass away or, leave it, or lose its force. Um, for example, he just gives an example here. It's kind of, it seems like a strange placement, but it was in the Sermon on the Mount. A man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery, and anyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. He's giving an example there. It seems like a very weird placement to have it. The point here is he's putting down the Pharisees. He's saying, okay, like, yeah. <laughs> You're not so great. Luke 16, 19. Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen <clears throat> and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing from scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open stores. The sores. Gross. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet, at the bosom of Abraham is like the phrase they're really using for this. The rich man also died and he's buried. And he went to the place of the dead. He went to hell. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in these flames, so just stop and think about this for a second. This guy wouldn't even like, give this poor guy his scraps. Now, you come serve me. Cool me off here in hell. Right? Hades, literally. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now 
He is being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. Now he's considerate. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. So he's forecasting what's going to happen, right? He's going to rise from the dead. Important lesson in there. You had your warning. <laughs> Not going to listen if anything else happens. So the point. So... Today we see when we look at this whole section, right, so we had the, uh, the, the one you probably knew is the prodigal son, right? You've probably heard some version of that, that story, that parable. But see what's around it. Do you notice that? There's a lot going on there. And so there's a benefit here of not interrupting Jesus. You get the point of what he's saying here. So these are familiar parables, but they're book ended by teachings about not being attached to worldly things, not placing those worldly things over heavenly things, right? And so the cost of being the disciple, right? You must, he's not telling you to be mean to your parents or hate your parents. That's not the point. It's hyperbole. You must hate your family. Well, yeah and no, but you, you must leave everything to follow me, he's saying. And to us today, you must be willing to. Leave everything to follow me. That's the point, right? And then there's the consequence with the rich man and Lazarus. There was, what? A penalty. There was a problem for him for not following God's law. Now, you have the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. That's always, always very interesting to me just studying that chapter because you see some numbers going on there. What, 100 sheep go after one. 10 coins, one. And then one to one, the father and the son. So you get this ratio. Jesus keeps getting closer and closer. And then the, the shrewd manager, which is surprising. A lot of people don't think about that or bother reading that and then taking it into consideration because you've just heard him give those parables. So the shrewd manager, at least he's being resourceful. But what's the point? How much more should we be with heavenly things? Now, this guy can do that for this. How much more should we be willing to get or be shrewd with? What did the son do in light of that? He squandered all the inheritance. They go together. And then the rich man and Lazarus, right? The price for disobedience. So when you put it all together, the father will seek you. So you get the sheep, right? The picture of Jesus with the sheep. He's going to seek us, right? So yes, he's going to seek us. Yes, the coin, going to seek us. But what happened? Prodigal son. He'll also let you go. He'll let you go. If you want to be disobedient, go ahead. So he seeks us, right? Then once he's let us go, what do we need to do? We need to seek him. The prodigal son had to come back. And last but not least, if you're not trustworthy, if you're ungrateful, there's going to be a price. So this is what Jesus is saying here. There's so much more enlightening now. The point is, he's ready to welcome you back. But be careful about gaming that system. A lot of people will do that. They know this, right? And so then they go, ooh, right? But if you game the system, what happens? We'll look into that. So the manager does what he does out of self-interest and worldly values. Here, Jesus is making the point that, in his words, if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you? with the true riches of heaven, trustworthy. And we should be much more obedient and trustworthy with God. And we shouldn't try to game his grace. So if you don't know, I'm familiar with the phrase, I don't know, I just thought of it. I don't know. Gaming his grace, sounds good, right? But what's the point? Gaming the system. Gaming any system is when what? We manipulate it. We play with it. Right? And so we might do that in our normal life, play with the system, play with our employer, game the system. But don't game God, because what happened to the rich man? 
You, know, you might pull it off here. You might play with people. But you cannot play with God. He's not to be trifled with. And that's Jesus' point here. Careful. So most of the time, people look at like one of these parables, just a piece. And you miss so much when you interrupt Jesus. You leave the sermon early, right? And you, you come in late. So if we do that during the lost sheep, we get the point. We get that, that God is seeking us. And then that's it sometimes, right? So, hey, we do whatever we want, right? God's like, literally, we get this picture in our head, like, we're just running like a little child. And God says, come back, come back, come back, you know, like that all the time, right? That's, that's it. That's all he's ever going to do. He's just going to keep doing that. As I go on this wild tear. And the minute I fall down, I stumble, oh, there he is to pick me up. And that's it. Right? That's what we get. Okay, partially true. But we miss the point that sometimes when we're doing that, he'll let us go. What's the prodigal son about? Okay, I want my inheritance. I'm going to go blow it. <laughs> okay, it's up to you. You missed that, right? So if we study only the prodigal son, though, and that's very common, that's the most popular of all of them, we get the point that God will forgive us and welcome us back. Good point. Yes, he does. But we needed to keep reading. If we game that grace, what happened? Father Abraham, help. I can't. You had your chance. And that's what we get if we keep reading. There's a progression here. Don't abuse his grace. So that pattern. God seeks, he forgives, but he condemns. We often leave that part out. That's very dangerous. God has sought us, but remember, he'll let us go to our own devices. If that's our choice, he's going to let you do that. Not anyone in particular, but that's what he does. And if he does, it's now on us. The son had to come back. It was on him at that point. We need to seek him. We need to go. He's going to welcome back, welcome us back. He's going to forgive us. But if we take advantage of that, that marvelous grace that he has for us, there will be consequences. Are we grateful for God's grace? Is that something we think about at all? You see, an attitude of gratitude is something that we show through obedience. I know you just all want, <laughs> we hate that word. No, it's like, that's what you say to a dog, you know, obey, obedience. But that's how we show we love him. Here's the thing. This is where it's going to get really dangerous, right? Go, he's going off the notes. This is where Heather gets worried. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not on the really good medication, just to let you know. And, <laughs> and that's a part of the problem. Like, he's so much better on the drugs, right? <laughs> so I'm not on a lot of drugs, and that's, that's kind of a part of my problem right now. My concentration's being kind of pulled at this point. So I know you. Will you have grace? <laughs> So let me be really honest, and that's, I have this section, like, be honest, but don't go crazy. Uh, so let's try. Uh, if I'm being honest, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I see a lot of lip service in church. You guys are, are pretty good. We, our crowd here, because we've developed that culture, like the biblical, so you're used to hearing really hard things, because it can be hard. Like, I just read you the Bible, people walk out, you know. It, I understand. It's tough. You guys, we have a culture of that here. I don't hold anything back. But the church we were before, more so, and still today, some people, but less. But the church we were a long time ago, it was a lot of lip service. It was a lot of lip service. We talked about that, the hypocrisy and everything. We, on the way here, we were even talking about some things, and it's like, Oh, how so many Christians misrepresent what Christianity really is. It's horrible. But, like, it's just a bunch of lip service. Tozer said it best. Like, you know, Christians don't tell lies. They just go to church and sing them. That's pretty good, right? I heard that one. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> this is crazy. So, you know, I'll throw myself under the bus. A lot of lip service. 
a lot of, for years until finally, like, oh no, I gotta kind of, this has gotta match. But I've told you guys this before recently. We're told that what? What is true worship? Read Romans 12. I get it. You know, oh, they have the Psalms, they have all this. Remember that? Okay, yeah, okay. There should be, singing, worship is about singing, right? Keep reading your Bible. Keep reading. Because Paul clarifies that in the New Testament. True worship is being a living sacrifice, right? This is what it's all about. It's about loving even your enemies. That's worship to God. And so on those Psalms, right, because that's what people will tell me, but the Psalms, eh. I, yes, I get it. It's all part of the Word of God. But what did God do to that temple they were singing those Psalms in? He destroyed it out of disobedience. That's what it was all about, worshiped other gods. Destroyed it. Isaiah, the prophets, right? what are they saying to these people? Isaiah 1, Amos 5, I can keep going. Take away from me the noise of your songs. Obedience is better than sacrifice. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. And it says it in the New Testament as well. That's a bunch of noise if you're not being obedient. It's lip service. And Jesus even reiterates this, quotes this. It's just lip service. I see so much of it. It's not about gaming God's grace. The joke is actually, you're playing yourself. Again, those people who do that are playing themselves. Joke's on them. It's not a funny one. Yes, we are saved by God's grace. <laughs> we should appreciate that. Right? Through our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it says, Ephesians 2. But if you keep reading to verse 10, we are created anew in Christ Jesus for good works, for obedience. That's how we show that we're grateful for his grace. Note what Jesus teaches. The man's actions had consequences. That's the point. He had Moses and the prophets. We assume he knew. But what happened? Playing around. Okay. He gained God's grace. And there were consequences. I'm going to read some hard scripture, but I don't want it to all come from me. It's something to absorb. And then we'll talk about it. Hebrews 10, 26. This is a New Testament, if you don't know. Okay, so it's not like, eh, the Old Testament. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there's no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There's only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Think about that in light of the rich man. Just think of how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, literally in the Greek, it's the spirit of grace who have insulted and disdained the spirit of grace who brings God's mercy to us. <sighs> yep. It's one of those. Now, here's the thing. As a pastor, I see this. There will come a time when it's too late. You have no idea what's going to happen to you. Now, please, no one die of a heart attack at that second. That would just <laughs> I have to live with that. Let's not do that. And I'm not going to say you're gonna, something's going to happen to you after church, because if it happens, I'll feel terrible. So, but you get it, right? You don't know. Your next breath is not like a given. I see more of this in ministry. And so I'm made constantly aware of this. And it's a crazy thing. So back to the country club Christians. I would do a lot of uh, ministry to them. When I first started out as a pastor in training, as a pit, you got to basically, the lead pastor gives you all of his visitations. <laughs> so that's what you, but you see it a lot, right? And it prepares you. It makes you want to quit. It's a good test because you're like, oh, I'm tired of this. and dying people all the time. You know? It was a much older church. So that's who you're shepherding, a much older crowd. Everyone was like, oh, I'm surprised you're here again. You know, they're, <laughs> you know, <and> what? <laughs> they're still, we have those conversations. He's still alive? Like, really? We got like duct tape and the whole parts. <laughs> yeah, it was like that, right? But it was, 
it was really tough because you'd see these people, and that particular environment is even worse, right? So it was really, really bad. Like the ushers had to wear white jackets, and they had flowers. and It was just crazy, right? So really, really fake. <clears throat> because I could see what's going on in the back end of their lives, and it didn't look anything. How you doing? Great. There was like one guy who would tell me, and I didn't appreciate that before I had to lead worship. But, <laughs> but how you doing? Fine. And I went go to their homes. No, it's not. Not at all. And it's not just that. I would see some of the stuff they were doing. You see the underbelly of everything, stuff they're doing, how they're living their lives, how they're manipulating. But you get to the point where they realize, uh-oh, like it's too late. Or it's going to be. I have to try to change immediately. And you know what usually happens nine times out of ten? Terror. Seen it. Terror. I'm going to throw myself right under the bus because I might not have been a country club Christian, so to speak, but, you know, I was faking it when I first started, totally faking it, even into the worship ministry quite a bit. When you're trying to be a pastor, it's very hard to fake it, so I love them quit. But in the worship ministry, it's really easy. It's easy to get up here and sing a bunch of lies. I'm not saying they did that. They did great. They're wonderful. But I'm saying I did. Me, 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 not them. I did. Sung a lot of lies. A lot of lies. And God was calling me into ministry, and he gave me this beautiful blessing of a mini stroke. Such a blessing. Best thing that ever happened to me. TIA, they call it. All right. So I got that and thought, oh, I might die <laughs> or be stuck like this, which would be worse. But I might die. And I realized, I'm like, okay, so what's going to happen? Right? So you start, at least me, I don't know everybody, but you kind of like play the tape on it a little bit, more than you were doing when you were living your crazy life. And all of a sudden, you want to kind of play chess with it now. You want to figure it out. And so in my head, I was like, what's going to happen? I'm like, I'm going to meet the author of life, and I don't even know what my favorite chapter is. That's what went through my head. Terror. Terror. Uh-oh. So I told my pastor in some desperate attempt, promise me you'll read me the Bible. So it came out of my mouth. Barely. Why? I, I don't know. And so that's me. So if you wonder why I read the Bible like all the time. That's my covenant with God. If you get me out of this, that's it. I'm going to quit the businesses. I'm, I'm just all in. That's it. Thank you for the stroke. Thank you. Better like, now, here's the thing. You don't all have to become pastors. That was my disobedience. That was my calling. It's not your calling necessarily. But what is he calling you to? My advice is, Listen, obey. You want to wait till it's too late, like my wisdom tooth. <laughs> right? I, was, I had to bring the temperature down just a tiny bit. <laughs> you have time. And remember this, there's joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. So there's a little thing Paul brings up in Romans 6, and I just want to bring it up too. It's this idea of gaming God's grace, and there are people doing it in the early church. And so he deals with it in Romans 6. And he does it quite intentionally. It's very intentional. So if you ever read Romans, if you've been in church for a long time, somebody might have taught on Romans 7 and then said, ooh, you see, Paul struggled with sin. <laughs> That's a good one. But Paul deals with that in chapters 6 and 8, right around 7. And when you read 6 and 8 and read 7 all at the same time, there is absolutely no way Paul struggles a lot with sin. No way. And 8, your new life in the Holy Spirit. That's it. 6, you're a slave to whatever controls you. We are not slaves of sin. We're no longer in bondage to that. What it is in 7, just so you say, what is he doing there? It's called prosopopeci. So when you know Greek, it's, you read it and you go, ah. There it is. Paul's playing the part of Adam. That's the direct context. Adam and Christ contrasted. And so what a miserable man I am. I do, I do what I don't want to do. It's a show. You get that when you can read it. Unfortunately, a lot of translations don't give that to you. So anyway, making fun of Adam. The whole thing is about a new life. You're a slave of God. That's a good thing. You're joined to God. You're not joined to sin. You're a slave of whatever controls you. But we're no longer slaves. It's not us. And that's the thing. 
Jesus makes his point in Luke 6. Go back, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say? Whatever controls you is your real master. And that's the point being made in Romans. Now, here's the thing. We're here to help. We're here to help. Like it's, sin is a heavy weight. It's exhausting. I've talked about this. The hypocrisy. It's exhausting. We're here to help. We can take those shackles off. Right? It's not us who ultimately does it. We're helpers of God. Those of us who've been blessed. I've been blessed with the stroke. I have an attitude of gratitude at this point. So I see things very differently. I don't see you as obstacles, although, like, after eight weeks, I need a vacation, right? But, <laughs> but I don't see you that way. I see you as opportunities. It changes the way I think. You're not a burden to me. I read you Galatians, I think, last week. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way, fulfill the law of Christ. Obey the law of Christ. It's an opportunity. Lord, present me with an opportunity. Someone who was like the person who brought me along, right? who encouraged me, who helped me, give me that. So I see you differently. So how we do it here, and, and sometimes people ask me, it goes back to the parables, we'll go full, full circle and then I'll stop because <laughs> I have no sense of time at this point. But you're all, you're all still alive, can't see with the lights. Now we're going to eat afterwards. Here's the thing, just real quick about the church. Some people have asked me, they're like, well, why don't you do altar calls? You know, why don't you do other things? So if you want to get baptized, it's on the, they tell you every service about how to fill out the connection card, and there's a call to baptism if that's what you want to do. So it's, it's out there, right? But why don't you do altar calls? So we used to do uh, beach services, and we did beach baptisms and stuff. And I'm, again, I will be real with you. Uh, just totally truthful, I've seen way more false baptisms and altar calls than real ones. Way more. Way more. What happens is like, oh, it's the beach. And sometimes they're drunk. We've, we baptize drunk people. They love the beach service because there's gumbo limbo. We can go get a few drinks and come out and watch the beach. I've seen it. Now, I'm not saying it happened in church, although it has happened in church, especially this one. But anyway, altar call. They get drummed up by the music and woo! I'm so excited, give my life to Jesus, right? Cry never turning back. But here's what I see on Facebook and in the real world and from what I get reports from people. That didn't stick. They're not sold out for Jesus, like literally that night when they're like arguing with their spouse, <laughs> right? being abusive. That's I see back there, the back end. I've seen it. way more false baptisms. But notice what did Jesus said before people followed him? And this is why. This is why it's false. And because there's like a whole bunch of fine print. They never read. They were misled. What did Jesus say? Why shouldn't we say what Jesus said? Right? Like, no, Jesus, I think you got it wrong. But what does he say? Count the cost. Right? Count the cost. You cannot... Be my disciple unless you hate your parents. So a lot of hyperbole there, but, you know, are you willing, if your family disagrees with you, are you willing to draw the line and say, no, Jesus? If your employer is pressuring you, whatever, not to go to church, whatever, are you willing to draw the line and say, no, I'm a Christian, Jesus is first? That's what he's saying. It could be a family, it could be anybody. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, but whatever. Jesus is using the family. Are you willing? You cannot be my disciple if you're not willing to make me first above everything else in your life. That's what Jesus said. So in the church today, before someone gets baptized, I like to read them that. I, I mean, I can put you in water, but you're not going to be baptized unless you agree to Jesus' terms and conditions. They're there, aren't they? What else is there? Deny yourself. Are you going to stop being selfish Realize God's grace fully and let that change you so everyone around you is an opportunity. Hey, friend, you look sad. Let me help you out. Is that how you're going to see everyone as if you're looking at the face of Jesus in every other human being, even your enemy? But that's what Jesus requires. It's not like a question he's asking. That's okay. No. 
calculate the cost. This is going to be tough. The Holy Spirit is going to empower you to get this done. But it's called progressive sanctification. It takes a little while to get it right. And even then, we're not Jesus. It's hard. Forgiveness is hard. Easier when you let the Holy Spirit in, which is another key. So that's the thing. When you don't build an infrastructure, it doesn't work. It would be like going to the gym once and saying, I'm in shape forever. You know? How's that work for you? <laughs> right? Right? You can't. And we know it doesn't work. You can't go on a diet for one day and then look awesome forever. If you ruin it, I'm sorry. Don't take it out on me. It's not my fault. It's the way things work. If we don't build an infrastructure and we don't maintain it, it's not going to stick. So it's like the gym membership. You have to read the fine print. You will be charged you know, too much every month, even if you don't come. It's not like, you know what I mean? like it doesn't work. Right? You got to read that and you sign the terms and conditions. And then say, maybe you get a trainer, but if you don't show up, the trainer's like, you're fat, you know, whatever it is. They're going to be honest with you. Maybe they won't if you're paying them way too much, right? So, <laughs> but you have it. That's what church is. There's an infrastructure here. It's very, very intentional. Believe me, I think of things. It's very intentional. I'm not going to try to scare anyone out of getting baptized, but here's the thing. Before you got baptized, you, were, you might as well have been working for the enemy. So he's not going to bother you. Satan doesn't care. But the minute you go, I'm a soldier for Christ. That's it. I'm his. He owns me. I'm not a slave to you anymore, Satan. I'm for Jesus. Oh, now he cares. Now, now he's interested in you. And if you don't have an infrastructure, if you don't have people around you to help you now, the devil's pretty powerful, let me tell you. He's going to get you. And so what do we need? The armor of God. We need to equip ourselves with that. And the church is a central part and is in the Bible. I want you to think about this. Think about like how much of the New Testament are letters. Where? The church. <laughs> the church, that's who Paul's writing to. The church and leaders in the church. The church is a central part of being a Christian. And that is a community. It is called the body of Christ. If you're not in the body of Christ, you're not a part of the body of Christ. What does that mean? Not good. You need to be a part of the body of Christ. And here we build each other up. We have an infrastructure, a maintenance program. We help each other. That's the point. And so we don't want to do things carelessly or foolishly like that. So that's all. So, as I conclude, if you're interested in getting baptized, that's fine. That's great. But here's what's going to happen. I want to have a conversation with you. <laughs> that's it, right? Isn't it a ridiculous thing that you can get baptized in a church and, like, not ever meet the pastor? Crazy. Doesn't happen here. We're going to sit down. Maybe I'll annoy you upstairs in the cafe while you're trying to eat. Uh, but we're going to have a meeting in my office, maybe, or somewhere, like, here. Doesn't matter. Let's just talk. Because I want to get to know you. Where do you think you're going to stumble? Like, what is Satan going to throw at you when you come out like that and say, I'm all for Jesus? Let's talk about it. Let's work. Let's get, get under it a little. Let's get an accountability companion, a buddy. It's not always me. Right? Okay, this person will be perfect for you. They're going to keep confidence. They'll help you work through it. Right? Good trainer. That's it. Let's build a family around you. Build each other up. So that's the thing. Allow us the opportunity to help bear your burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for getting me through that. <laughs> uh, thank you for all these gracious people this morning. I love them all. Uh, just fill their hearts with you, just a desire to be close to you, God. And, and just, just give them the courage to come forward express their feelings about what they're going through and open up a little bit, those who need it. And those who are serving, just keep them strong in you, Lord, so they can help bear one another's burdens, build each other up. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you.